I want to tell you about our upcoming event, December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, right here in Santa Barbara. Saturday, we're going to have uh, podcast recordings. I've got uh, Michael Schellenberger coming, the independent journalist who worked on the Twitter files, as well as other big issues, homelessness, nuclear power. He's uh, really an interesting uh, fellow. Pete Bogosian is going to do his street epistemology with us. On Sunday, I have Jared Diamond coming up from L.A. We're going to record a live podcast uh, episode with him as well, and you'll be participating. Much of the time will be spent with just uh, questions and comments from the audience. So it's going to be big, big fun. We've got a fundraising dinner on Saturday night. Uh, it's a beautiful resort, this whole area. Well, Santa Barbara, come on. People pay to come here on vacation, and you can too, and get uh, some great um, knowledge from interesting people as well. So check it out. December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, right here in Santa Barbara. All righty, everybody. It's time for another episode of the Michael Shermer Show. This one brought to you by, of course, the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. Here we go. You can pick up your physical magazine. There are lots of people with digital magazines, but we're the real thing. And we're digital, too. At any fine bookstore near you, or you can go to skeptic.com, click on magazine, and you can subscribe right there. Uh, and if you like the show and want to support our nonprofit science education organizational materials and efforts like this podcast, you can go to skeptic.com slash donate and give us a little love there. All right. Enough time for the uh, commercial there. My guest today is uh, Liza Mundy. is an award-winning journalist and the New York Times bestselling author of four books, including Code Girls. A former staff writer for The Washington Post, Mundy writes for The Atlantic, Politico, and Smithsonian, among other publications. And here's her new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. What a great cover. I love that cover. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, yeah, you've got the galleys. I've got the finished oh, book. Oh, that's and, much uh, nicer. I, I think it looks And you have, yeah. Is wonderful. that is that yeah. Lisa uh, yes. Harper? Yeah, that was her undergraduate photo at Brown. Uh, when she was recruited. And then it's got, I, I think the book has a great photo insert also that the women shared photos with me. This is Lisa's page. Uh, it shows oh my God. In the fall. Wow. It was a class when they're learning to wear disguises. It shows her as a debutante when she's being recruited. Oh by my the God. So anyway, I, I'm really happy with the photo insert. Also. That picture, hold that one up again of her, uh, the one that's on the cover. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so this was her senior year at Brown University. That's astonishing. I yeah. mean, she, what, she's like 20 there, 21 or something? Yeah, tw 21, that's right. And, I mean, and I mean, she looks like Lauren Bacall, like a Hollywood <laughs> movie star. Oh, my God. Well, so she, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree. And uh, and someone looked at it and said, oh, that's Mata Hari. And that, that <laughs> did not occur to me. <laughs> to tell so. That's right. No, no, she's better looking than Mata Hari. But Mata Hari was a bit, well, whatever. <laughs> that's from a previous generation. That's... Yeah. World yeah. War One, right, Matahari? Um, oh yeah. Let's see. And in, in your in the beginning of your your intro, you mentioned some of the fictional female spies, but I think you left out the most famous one of all uh, from. Um, oh, what's uh, now? I'm forgetting her name. Uh, hang on. Um, you know the. Uh, it'll come to me. Never mind. <laughs> okay. uh, the FBI from um, uh, Hannibal Lecter. Oh uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> would she be considered a spy though? I mean, she's more. Uh, of a yeah, that's that's true. Job. Not a spy. Yeah. yeah. Actually, maybe that's a good good place to start. What, what What is the CIA? How does it differ from the FBI? Why do we have these intelligence agencies in the first place? Well, the FBI is a law enforcement agency, and so it's their job to arrest people and uh, to, to, you know, to, to conduct investigations, to track down criminals and to arrest them. And, uh, and the FBI and the CIA, they work together, but they're often at odds. And some people say, well, the FBI are the cops and the CIA are the robbers. <laughs> and, the, and, and the reason we have now in Washington, we have 18 intelligence agencies. Uh, the Space Force is our most recent addition. But in World War II, we had none of these. We didn't have a CIA. We didn't have an NSA. We didn't have a Space Force, clearly. And the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor was the tragedy and the surprise that exposed our almost unbelievable lack of intelligence gathering capabilities. So it was after the attack at Pearl Harbor when, of course, we entered World War II, we being the United States, uh, and we're sending ultimately, you know, hundreds of thousands of young men into harm's way. And we needed to ensure that an attack like that didn't take us by surprise or happen again. So uh, very quickly, the U.S. military and civilian establishments uh, 
the scaled up, as we would call it now. And because the young men were shipping out to fight, it's extraordinary how many women were recruited, and I mean tens of thousands, into the, uh, this was really the birthplace of our intelligence establishment. And uh, it was so women were recruited into all fields of intelligence to build our capabilities during World War II. So that, that's why we have them. Yeah. That, uh, but, but before Pearl Harbor, we had already broken the Japanese code magic, right? So who was doing that? Women, largely. Uh, we had a couple of small code-breaking bureaus. The U.S. Army had a civilian code-breaking bureau, and that was the team that broke uh, the code system called uh, Purple, well, called Magic. The, the machine that, ja that the Japanese diplomats were using was, was called um, Purple, and we had never seen it, uh, unlike the German Enigma machine, which had been used by businesses in Europe, and so people had at least seen uh, some iterations of the Enigma ciphering machine, but the Japanese were using a machine that nobody had ever seen. And it was a team of American mathematicians that, that simply looking at messages, uh, were able to detect the patterns and coincidences that enabled them to basically reverse engineer that machine. And it was a woman named Genevieve uh, Grochen who had uh, a degree in mathematics, had been able to, unable to find any U.S. college or university who would hire her as a mathematician. So she had been hired to calculate a railroad pensions in the U.S. government, and, and the head of the Army's small civilian code-breaking bureau, William Friedman, saw her score on a test that she took in order to get a routine promotion, and he recruited her into the Army's code-breaking efforts. So uh, there was a parallel, very small code-breaking unit in the U.S. Navy uh, there was a civilian woman working for the U.S. Navy, Agnes Driscoll, who, over the course of the 1930s, diagnosed how the Japanese Navy uh, enciphered their communication system. And that was different than the way the Japanese diplomats uh, enciphered theirs. And so it was really two women who, who uh, had the breakthroughs that we needed before the war I mean, we, we go into why Pearl Harbor was a surprise. It had to do with the fact that the Japanese had changed their code books. And although we understood how the system worked, the naval system, uh, we, we had to, it always took a little bit of, of time to, to break back into a new code book. Yeah, interesting. I remember there was a, uh, a conspiracy theory, one of our uh, topics that we covered, Skeptic, that uh, Roosevelt either knew it was going to happen, he, he let it happen on purpose, or made it happen on purpose, lie hop and my hop in 9-11 jargon. Uh, but in fact, uh, right. it, because they point to, you know, some memos, like, oh, the Japanese might attack, you know, uh, Hawaii. But in fact, there were like hundreds of pieces of intel. They may attack here, there, everywhere. And that the White House was getting too much uh, information and there was no clearinghouse or you know somebody that kind of sorts through that for Roosevelt so they just quit sending some uh, information that's right recognizing the signal and the noise is yeah. a huge challenge in intelligence and that would be true uh, before 9-11 as well because there were signals uh, it, and there was a lot of noise before that attack as well yeah interesting yeah the whole thing is a kind of a signal detection problem you want to avoid false positives and false negatives and get the hits and correct rejections, but that's hard to do. Right. And you also want to make sure that the people who are hearing the signal uh, get listened to and that they have credibility and that they get paid attention to by the people at the top. And that's always a challenge. Uh, and it certainly became a challenge in these big institutions after the war when the CIA was created and grew very quickly it became a very competitive bureaucracy, a lot of jostling for position, multi-layer bureaucracy, so that uh, largely female, young female analysts in the 1990s who were paying attention to Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and trying to draw attention, were they were seeing the signal, uh, but they were having a hard time persuading the people at the top uh, that this wasn't just noise. Is it? This is jumping ahead a little bit. We can go back in time yeah, in I a minute, ahead. but but that's okay. Um, I mean, is it your sense that 
had women had equal standing and were listened to, 9-11 may not have happened? Well, it's certainly possible uh, that if more attention had been paid earlier, uh, that that we could have avoided the attack. The attacks. I mean, it was. Um, uh, this is such a tired cliche now, but it was a, a perfect storm. Uh, in the, there were a lot of factors that went in, but it, it is it is clearly true that there were that there were these young female analysts who were committed to this new uh, field of intelligence called counterterrorism who went into that field in part because they were channeled into that field. It wasn't as sought after. It wasn't as prestigious. In the 1980s and 90s, you wanted to be in um, anti-Soviet, you know, uh, counter, you wanted to be taking on the communists. And so that, that was, that was the field of intelligence where there wasn't as much headroom. There were entrenched uh, older officers who had built their careers on our contest with the Soviet Union and were taken aback when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, or at least there was a period where the um, espionage establishment was floundering, trying to figure out who the new enemy was. And these young women, in the meantime, had had entered this field of, of paying attention to terrorist activities uh, and were therefore well-positioned to spot the threat, but they were not well positioned to make themselves heard mm. through no fault of their own. Right. Yes, of course. That's been the problem since the beginning, which is what your whole book is about. What about that memo that August 9th, Condoleezza Rice, Al-Qaeda to strike U.S. on U.S. soil? You know, in hindsight, people look back, go, aha, they should have known it was coming or Bush sure. let it happen on purpose or whatever. But wasn't the problem that there was just tens of thousands of pieces of intel like that? Well, that was a very, uh, the, the counterterrorism center at the CIA and these women analysts, that, that memo was written by a woman named Barbara Sood, who had been paying attention to this for a long time. And what is so surprising about that August 6th memo, which came on the heels of a whole cascade of memos they've been warning all year, is that the Bush administration did not have a high-level meeting to try and develop a strategy until uh, about four weeks after that memo was published. It was published in the so summer doldrums and the administration was slow to react. That was the, um, that was the most a highly publicized memo, uh, but it was by no means the only one. Right. Yeah, again, hindsight bias distorts us uh, on this. When, once you know what happened, then it's easy to look back at the intelligence ago, we should have seen it come. And part of the problem was, though, that the different intelligence agencies were not communicating with each other, right? Absolutely, yes. And that, you know, again, going back to World War II, there's always been so much competition between our branches of the military, as well as our federal agencies and intelligence agencies and law enforcement, that uh, that it this is this was a problem during World War II. Uh, we talked about that code system that the Japanese diplomats were using both the uh, during World War II, both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy were working to break that code system. The Army succeeded, but the Navy was so competitive with the Army that that for uh, several months, there, this is this um, uneasy compromise was arrived at, whereas the Army got to break the code, got to work the code system on the um, the odd days and the Navy on the even days or vice versa. And if an important message came through, they would literally run race to be the first to deliver it. So, it, you know, in the end, it comes down to things like appropriations and competing for funds and competing for prestige uh, in the in the federal establishment here. And that is, a, I guess, a story as old as time. Oh, yeah. I had uh, Fred Barnes on the show, his book on uh, nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and how, you know, just how we ended up with the triad was because there was competition between the Navy, Air Force and uh, Army about, you know, who's going to get the funding to build these weapons. And and that's how we ended up with just like endless numbers of weapons targeted at just nothing uh, targets in the Soviet Union, like in Siberia. I think there was one where they had like 60 nuclear weapons targeted for some airport that was only open one month a year because of the weather, whatever, just because they were competition for a limited budget. Right, right. And redundancy is always, yeah.
not helpful. In right. Situation. Okay, another interesting observation, just general, about your book, which I really loved. It was a great read. I told you I listened to it all. 18 hours. I listened at 1.5 speed, so I got through it a little faster than that. But it reads like a Tom Clancy novel. It's like a spy okay. story. It's incredible. Well, it's a spy story. Thank you. Because it, <laughs> yeah. it, as it, it felt like a, a multi-generational saga, spy saga. But it is a spy story, so thank you. Right, absolutely. But, you know, in this kind of post-Me Too movement, when we all take the training sessions about, you know, reducing, uh, you know, sexual contact and all that. How much sex people had in your book? Oh, my God. Everybody's sleeping with everybody. Astonishing. <laughs> yeah. Although just to just to sort of clarify that, because it's it's one of the one of the sort of knocks against women in, in, in espionage is that it's always assumed that the only role or the chief role women play in spycraft is seduction, is, mm. you know, is eliciting secrets through pillow talk. And certainly, I mean, maybe it would be an overstatement to say, but nothing is further from the truth, but actually nothing is further from the truth. So, so the women in my book were generally very careful not to get involved, certainly in affairs with their assets, with the people that, that were, who were giving them secrets, because you need to maintain control in a situation where you're working with what's called an asset, a foreign national who is handing over secrets. If you're the CIA officer, you're paying that person money or you're going to relocate that person's parents to better housing, or you're going to you're going to find medical care for that person's child, and you're working very hard to control that situation and maintain control over it. And so, uh, certainly, the women case officers I interviewed were very careful not to have relations like that with their assets, not to have sexual relations. But meanwhile, those women were being hit on, particularly in the Cold War during the war. And after the war, the women were being relentlessly hit on by the men they worked for and the men in their office to the point where you think, God, was this whole agency created <laughs> just, so that, just so that men could have reason to like be, meet, you know, be with their assistant in some clandestine room and hit on and literally chase them around the bed. So uh, so women were brought in after the war as the CIA is created. It's going to be a big institution. It's growing quickly. Uh, you need secretaries, you need typists, uh, but women are also brought in basically as office candy, as, as, as arm candy, as, as office wives. Uh, and, and not everybody, but there was a widespread expectation that the women would be available and, to them. And, and so every woman I interviewed had to contend with that. Again, not from everybody. There were men who were wonderful allies and mentors to the early women case officers, but it, it also, as long as we're on this topic, one of the other inducements that CIA officers used, particularly during the Cold War before the Internet, uh, to to persuade foreigners to cooperate, or if they're just, if they're just you know there's this there's this period where you're trying to recruit somebody to become a spy, who's a foreign national, recruit them to hand over secrets, and so you want to butter them up, you want to take them out to dinner, you want to make nice, and so. So during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, pornography was one of the inducements that would, particularly if it was given to somebody who was in a society, be it uh, communist China or uh, an Islamic country in Africa or the Middle East, that I, I was, when I was reading the memoir of Dewey Claridge, she was a famous spy who was ultimately involved in Iran-Contra. He talked about how uh, you, in order to cultivate a potential asset, you have them over and you show them Debbie Does Dallas that pe people might remember. Uh, that, maybe, well, like, that was a way of buttering people up. So weirdly enough, like there was porn in people's drawers, you know, and so the women just they really had to operate in this in this environment and find their way in an environment that was <laughs> That was very treacherous uh, in, in many ways. And, yeah, and my, my question is... And to worry about weren't necessarily the adversary countries all the time. Right, no, uh, I was talking about just the, within the agency, sexual relations. Exactly. Although I suspect, I don't know much about the history of corporate America, but I suspect right. most big corporations in the 50s yeah. and 60s had the same thing going on. The same thing, but there are many, many more uh, opportunities for secret encounters in mm. Spycraft because it really relies on secret encounters. And so it's easy if you want to have an affair and you tell your wife, well, I'm going out tonight to do what I do for the CIA. And instead you could be going out for any number of reasons. So I do think that in clandestine kind of work, uh, secret meetings are part of the culture. 
Uh, yeah. So it might be a little different from corporate America in that way. But yeah, and I, pres I, I presume that has changed pretty dramatically now post Me Too. Yeah, but there's still I mean, there's still a uh, yes, that that part of it has changed. But <laughs> there still is consensual uh, sexual activity between CIA officers. And because, again, you're in these weird situations where you're in a deserted outpost in an African country and you have very uh, few outside contacts. Um, Often you end up dating and marrying within the intelligence establishment because you're all working clandestinely. So there still is maybe a little bit more of a, um, a you know, a partnering with each other as opposed to partnering with people in the outside world. Uh, so I'm not sure there's less sex. There's just maybe <laughs> yeah. more. Sex. But it, but it's not between a CIA officer and an asset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned early in the book about what the purpose of the CIA is. You said something like in between war and diplomacy, you have this third option that presidents have. Like, I don't want to go to war with this country. Diplomacy is breaking down. Yeah. All right, get get the spies in there and figure out what's going on. Let's see if we can manipulate the election or support this guy over that guy. I'm fond of talking about, you know, rig, rigged elections in, in uh, say, countries where it's between the fascist dictator and the communist dictator, and at least the fascist is going to be friendlier to U.S. business interests. So let's see what we can do down there without anybody, and giving the president a probable deniability. Right, that's very well put. There's, there's you know, two kinds of clandestine activity. There's the collecting of information, which is what I've been talking about, spying in which you're, you're recruiting, if you're the CIA officer, you're recruiting uh, and handling and getting inf eliciting information from, from foreign nationals to simply provide information to the U.S. president and the national security establishment. And what you're talking about is the thing that always gets the CIA into trouble, which is covert action, which is manipulating elections, overthrowing foreign leaders, in some cases assassinating or trying to assassinate foreign leaders, paramilitary campaigns, uh, enhanced interrogation uh, in the post 9-11. And so invariably, that is the aspect of clandestine activity that gets uh, the agency in trouble. I remember reading about the U-2 spy plane and the SR-70 word Blackbird and all these great aircraft and that the CIA had its own Air Force separate from the Air Force or, <laughs> or something like right. that. Yeah, uh, that that's that's absolutely true, and developed Amazing. obviously a, a lot of uh, a lot of spy technologies, a lot of surveillance uh, um, technologies, and there are a lot of satellites uh, up there that are um, are are keeping an eye on all parts of the globe. And in fact, the women I talked about who were um, paying attention early on to Al Qaeda, trying to figure out what it was. A number of them, a striking number of them had trained as imagery analysts. They came in in the 1980s when there was a move to admit more women. They were sort of routed into obscure fields. And so um, planes like the U-2 that were taking all this aerial imagery that was harder to analyze, it was not as uh, distinct, you know, as images today, uh, they, they just had to spend a lot of time really carefully pouring over the film that came in every day from these spy planes. And they learned to be very, very careful to really pay attention to detail and to write persuasive reports that, that told the story of the development of a missile system. Uh, and then to pay attention to changes over time. And I was really struck by how it was a number of women who had trained this way who then ended up working in other uh, branches of the CIA as their careers progressed and so what? So then they got to a point where they were listening to intercepts, uh, intercepts of terrorists talking in safe houses after the Afghan war. They were paying attention to travel records. They were trained to put together all these bits and pieces to recognize a kind of a shadowy, indistinct object and to, to say what it was, like, what is this thing? And that was the analogy that they used in the 1990s when they were trying to figure out, okay, all these fighters, foreign fighters who've been fighting in Afghanistan against the Soviets. That war is over. The Soviet Union has collapsed. But these guys aren't going home. They're spreading all over the world. They're going to Chechnya. They're going to Indonesia. They seem to be communicating with each other. We've got some incorporation documents. There's some lawsuits. We've got these intercepts. What, 
what is the what is this thing? Uh, and and so their anyway their their training was on these grainy images from these early spy technologies, and they took that training into this field of counterterrorism. And again, they had to persuade the people at the top that the thing they recognized was in fact a thing. And I, I'm saying that, that that's the way they put it to me. It was a yeah, long that's... time before we figured out what Al Qaeda was. Right. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. I was my only connection to this is looking at aerial photographs from B-17 bombers flying over Auschwitz yeah. on the way to the IG Farben plant to bomb it. And the amount of detail, this was 1940, August 1944, the amount of detail from 30,000 feet or whatever it was, it's astonishing. Well, that's uh, interesting. So, yeah, and yeah. there were a lot of women doing that work during the war, doing the, the mapping and, the, um, and, and uh, working on the aerial photography as well. Again, because it was non-combatant type of work, but it was in, incredibly important. Right. What kind of personality and temperament does the CAA look for in various job positions that they have. I mean, so reading some really, of that, it's like, you're going to go off to this African country and live there for years. Like, Whoa, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> um, the, the training and evaluate the, the testing and evaluation of CIA officers is such an interesting history. And one of my uh, most, my favorite documents that I immersed myself in during the research was during World War II, when we, we as a country were suddenly recruiting people into a spy service there was no playbook for how you can gauge how a person smart, resourceful, but how can they function working clandestinely in occupied France or in China or being parachuted in uh, behind the lines in, in France? And, uh, and so these different tests were devised. Uh, there were uh, there were stations set up, say, in the Virginia countryside, in which men who were being considered for overseas work, uh, blowing up train depots or parachuting into occupied France, would be immersed in these imaginary role-playing situations. They would be formed as teams, and they would be um, put in front, say, of a, a stream, a country stream, and they were told with some two-by-fours, and they would say, okay, imagine you're a scouting party, and this is a, this is a rushing river, and there are cliffs on either side, and you've got a machine gun, and you've got a transport it against the chasm, and you're being pursued, and, and so how are you going to do it? And they, they, would be, they would be observed not only to see how well they could put together two by fours, but uh, to see who would emerge as a leader, who could tolerate frustration, who was automatically trusted by the other men. And, and then some, but some of the tests, they would, um, they would sort of ratchet up the difficulty and they would appoint certain people to actually um, shirk and work against the operation and try to thwart the leader because they wanted to see how well you could tolerate frustration and people who were, uh, you know, snafu, situ what, what is that, situation normal all fouled up. Uh, and, and so they wanted to see how you could tolerate frustration. And uh, so, so, and I think those are lasting characteristics that, uh, that a place like the CIA looks for. But what was so interesting, when they would recruit the women, and there were thousands of women recruited into espionage, American espionage during the war, they recruited very well-educated women, often from um, staff, from affluent families, but not always. Uh, women who were in the workforce at a time when that was so unusual, had university educations at a time when that was unusual, uh, were very, very well-qualified and successful. And they put them in a room and they said, okay, here are 10 memos. We need you to, fi you, we need you to figure out a good filing system for filing memos and then being sure that they would be easily retrievable. And so they were basically put to do secretarial work because that was how these women were going to be started out during the war. But they were also, that was also a test of their ability to withstand the frustration of being underutilized, of having skills that went beyond the tasks they were assigned to do because the testers, the psychologists who were doing this test had already realized that that was happening to the women in the spy service, that they were incredibly well qualified, wanted to serve the war effort. They were in positions beneath their abilities and they had to have the stamina and the resilience to put up with that and figure out a way around it. And what really struck me was that held true for decades and decades and decades after the war. And so many of the women I interviewed, the spies, were brought in as clerks, were brought in as secretaries, were brought in as wives 
or were brought in as recruits, but then once they got married, they were fired, essentially, and then then expected to do the same work on behalf of their husbands that they weren't paid. Like, there were so many frustrations and so many ways in which they were underused that that particularly this generation of women, and you could compare them, say, to Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, who really had put up with an unrelenting series of frustrations to get to where they did. Uh, and so at least in the women, well, in all of the officers, you really have to be resourceful and able to withstand frustration. Um, but I think that was particularly true in a different way for women at the beginning and then for, for decades afterwards. But to continue answering your question, if you are going to be a CIA case officer, if you're going to be working overseas trying to spot foreign nationals who might be willing to pass secrets, trying to butter them up, get to know them. It's uh, it's called recruiting, uh, invite them to dinner, show them porn, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, persuade them to spy, to, to betray their country, persuade them to betray their country on behalf of the United States. You have to be an extrovert. You have to be charismatic. You have to be persuasive. You have to be manipulative. Not always, but these are characteristics that, that the agency looks for um, that can help you succeed and uh, and so that's that's sort of one personality type. And, and of course, you can sort of fall over into the overly manipulative, overly willing to do pretty much anything that always leads to problems in these you know, covert actions that we talked about. They lead to Iran Contra, you know, willingness to skirt the law uh, and or, you know, all these assassination plots, um, a willingness to go too far. Uh, but but I think for the case officers who are going to be working overseas in the clandestine part of the service, a comfort with gray zones, with uh, a moral, ethical gray zone, and an ability to arrive at your own ethical code or ethical core to know like what you can be okay with and and what not uh, is is important. When you're talking about the analysts, when you're talking about the intellectual people who are going to be uh, reading over the, the intelligence collected and, and very carefully uh, studying so many sources of intelligence and writing reports, because the CIA, people don't realize this, the CIA is also a big publishing house. It, it all sorts of the, the, the August 6th warning that went to the president and very high level people in national security. Uh, that's just one of of countless uh, daily items, monthly items, different reports that are written. And so, if you're an analyst, you have to uh, you have to be able to retain a lot of information, read carefully, and then argue, argue, argue with your colleagues over what the CIA as a whole is going to tell the president is going on in whatever country. Um, so if I'm writing something for the Washington Post or writing a book, I'm writing it as myself, as an individual, and I'm taking responsibility personally that it's accurate. Uh, but if you're writing for the CIA, you're writing what they call a corporate product. Like as, as officer said to me, the president doesn't want to know what I think. The president wants to know what the CIA thinks. So if you're trying to write about, oh, there's this entity called Al Qaeda and we think they're a real threat, you have to get the, if they're operating in the Soviet Union, you have to get the Soviet analyst to sign off on what you're writing. If they're operating in Indonesia, you have to get the Indonesian analyst to sign off on what you're writing. And you have to be willing to argue and make your case. And uh, so the willingness, you know, almost like recreational arguing, uh, you're considering things from every angle. Are we really right about that? Uh, and, and to make your case to your colleagues. And so that's what gets back to what we were talking about at the beginning, recognizing the signal, but then being heard through the noise, including the noise of your own workplace. Yeah. So I'm sorry, reminded that's of, a wordy answer, but it's a Oh, no, no, it's, that's really super interesting. I was reminded of Phil Tetlock's um, book on super forecasters and his research on who's good at forecasting the future and who's not. And after more than five years out, nobody can do any better than chance. But the, the, the good uh, super forecasters were kind of Bayesian in their projections, you know, not, not couching anything as absolute one way or the other, just you know, 50% probability or 80% probability, constantly adjusting their um, 
their credences based on changing priors from new evidence that comes in and so on and so forth. And, and um, that's hard to do. Most people don't think like that. So right. how would you test for that? You know, who's a good Bayesian in their uh, way of thinking about the probabilities of something happening? And, you know, the biases, he talks about the biases on this. You know, for example, if you ask, what are the probabilities that Putin will invade Ukraine uh, versus uh, what are the probability or, w that, that Putin will invade Ukraine because of something that NATO did and you add more details. Well, the first one's gonna be more likely uh, because the more details you add, the less likely it is to happen compared to the broader one. But our bias is that the more details you give me, the, the higher probability I'm gonna give it because I'm a storyteller and I like stories with details, something like that. Um, so, you know, I don't know how you would go about testing uh, pro projective uh, agents for for something like that. Right, and, I, and also you have to select for people who have the temperament to withstand not being heard. Uh, and one of the analysts I talked to, and she she was paying attention to Al-Qaeda beginning in, uh, she wrote the first paper for the, it was actually for the State Department. She was the State Department at the time in 1993, identifying bin Laden and Al-Qaeda as serious threats to the United States. And she said, she said, you know, anybody can be a pretty good analyst. Um, but if you're if you're a really decent analyst, that was the word she is decent. Uh, you're going to be seeing things at a period of time when people just aren't going to listen to you. You're 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 just going to be ahead of the curve, and you're going to have to learn how to make your peace with that or put up with the frustration of it. So it's not just making the forecast; it's um, it's putting up with not being listened to. Uh, and, and sort of reconciling yourself to that, but also not giving up. Uh, so that's that's a personality trait that even if you're really good at statistics and probabilities and forecasts, you don't necessarily, you know, to putting up with the rows of fools, uh, the people who are just thwarting you and not listening. It, it goes back again to those early World War II exercises when you have to put up with the fools in your ranks and the... <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I there should, there should sure. be a test for that. How tolerant yeah. of you are you? Oh, there is sort of a tough mindedness. How, how, how readily do you suffer fools gladly? <laughs> right. And, and also, you know, this this probability uh, there, during the hunt for Osama bin Laden, you know, there were a number of, of moments where uh, Barack Obama as president or Leon Panetta as CIA director would go around the table and ask these uh, both high-level managers and the more ground-level targeters, many of whom were women, uh, what do you think is the probability that Osama bin Laden is in that compound? And the closer a person was to the work itself, the lower level, by lower level, I just mean the ground floor targeters, the people who were doing this work every day, they were close to 100%. And the and the higher level the official was, the more they were like, oh, God, I remember, you know, with weapons of mass destruction and we screwed up that one. And and uh, and so the the probability, the willingness to go out on a limb and have confidence in your forecast went down the higher the level of official. Right. So you mentioned that personality test. No, escape my memory here. What What is it? The one with the has the letters that. Uh designate people's personality. Oh, so, um, the Myers-Briggs. Yeah, Myers-Briggs. Yeah, I can't believe that anybody still uses that. I mean, that's been pretty debunked by scientific psychology. Well, and that was developed by a couple of women, by a mother-daughter team uh, during the war, because again, it was World War II when right. all this uh, all this personality testing and, and testing of potential uh, really got off the ground along with a lot of our STEM technology because there was so much new kind of work. There was espionage and there was code breaking and there were uh, early computers being being developed and, and rocket trajectories and just new kinds of work and more and more people being brought into the war effort. And so I think that was when a lot of these personality assessments was, were born. But the people... The people I talked to, the analysts I talked to at the CIA, they still seem to take these Myers-Briggs categories pretty seriously. Really? It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I never, I've never taken the test, and I, so I forget you're an INTJ, like what does that yeah. stand for? But they yeah. do talk in those terms uh, a, a fair amount. Well, well I, there, I, I'll there, 
on what the most category. of them are yeah they're like roar sharks or they're like a a psychic reading cold reading you know you just back into it whatever you think will apply to almost anybody and then after the fact they they make it fit yeah that's the problem so you're finding story to turn the tables but is it you're finding as a skeptic that it's really not possible to 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 there aren't many the only personality dimension that works is the big five uh personality dimension uh o ocean o-c-e-a-n openness to experience conscientiousness extroversion introversion o-c-e-a agreeableness disagreeableness and then and neuroticism or you know kind of emotional ups and downs um you know so if you're high in conscientiousness um you probably like a job like at the cia right you're you, you want to you know make sure everything is done thoroughly and completely and yeah yeah openness to experience right you, you, uh, probably gonna... another good trait you like to travel people that like to travel yeah uh are high in openness to experience they're comfortable yeah. being in a new environments that they've never yeah. encountered um, that, would be a case officer. that would be the clandestine officer who's posted abroad, willing to just sort of uh, go with whatever situation develops, whereas the analysts would be the ones who are the, are the careful conjecturing. Yes, yes. Agreeableness. I think your your female analyst would have to be high in agreeableness to tolerate the assholes in the office that are treating them so badly. Yeah, I mean, but I, you gotta be you gotta be pretty disagreeable sometimes too. I don't know what the opposite of this is. Oh yes, right. That's true. Yes, but right. You gotta okay. be willing to assert right. yourself when when you're being right. and truly undermined by uh by <laughs> other other desks and other offices within the very institution that you work for. I mean mm. that was really striking to me is um is the is the undermining that went mm. on in this mm. workplace. I mean, I worked in a newsroom for 20 years at the Washington Post, and certainly you might make professional friends and professional enemies, I guess, but enemy would even be a strong mm. word. I mean, the people you got along with, people you didn't, people who were uh, formidable and intimidating. But but I, I encountered so many examples of, of true undermining uh, in, in the spy agency and having to really n not be able to trust your colleagues. Mm. Uh, that that you would have to be somehow both agreeable and really tough. Tough-minded, yeah. And, and, and if you've read the book, I mean, you know that there are examples of for some of the early women who were made, uh, this uh, woman, Eloise Page, who came out of World War II. She was one of the few women who managed to hang on out of World War II, and she became the first female station chief at the CIA, and that was very controversial in the early 1970s she was sent to Athens as the station chief and she had she was terrifically feared and and disliked and even hated by women and men at the CIA because she had had to be really sharp elbowed and really tough to rise at the CIA and she controlled budgets and so the men would have to go in and beg her for money and so they they didn't like her and and so they sent her overseas uh in, in a way to to get her out of headquarters where she had control over their budgets and also because they thought that she really couldn't function in a macho society like Greece. Uh, and it turned out that she was as she had been educated at several different women's colleges. She was from a very old line Virginia family, Virginia gentry. So she had a lot of social graces in social situations. And so it turned out the Greeks loved her uh, because she she was just very well mannered and gracious, and they they thought she was interesting, and uh, and and they liked her, and they sort of took her under their wing. So so the guys who hated her decided that they would try to discredit her by sending an emissary to the station in Athens, creating an excuse to bring her back to Washington to sit on a panel, and in her absence, they sent an emissary to the stations in Athens. And they said to all of her employees, the case officers, OK, look, we know that she's not any good and we're going to get rid of her. And I and the guy said, I'm going to be the new, I'll, I'll be the new station chief. And so we want you to tell us, you know, just how bad is she? And uh, and so some of the guys went along with it. Oh, yeah, she's terrible. Da, 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 da. And and some of them, some the officer who was telling me this had been warned, like, don't get involved in this. So he so he didn't he didn't you know, dish the dirt on her. And, and he actually liked her and admired her. So so it was a conspiracy against her to try to remove her. And when she came back from Washington, she called all the officers in the station in and 
and she knew what had happened. She she was so well wired in the institution that she knew what had happened. She knew the names of the people who had ratted on her, and she knew the names of the people who had been loyal to her, and she got rid of the of the rats. I mean, she she kicked them out. And and so we talk about agreeableness. And yeah, like she had to be agreeable to the Greek officials she was working with and butter them up and everything. But she was hard elbowed and tough as nails. Uh, I mean, I know there's being a cliche, but uh, but that's an example of the sort of complex character traits that you had to prevail in this uh, environment. And it wasn't just the women, but it was it, particularly in those early days, it was particularly true of the women. You really had to watch your back. And again, not just the adversary. It wasn't just that you were leaving your home and you were looking at in the street to see if you were being surveilled uh, by the KGB. You also had to watch who was in the station and whether or not they were they were loyal to you. I mean, it's extraordinary. Wow. It really, how they and, and would that apply to, to, to men as well against other men? There's just a competitive yeah. environment. Yeah. yeah, I think so, uh, for sure. I, I think, you know, women would have been more vulnerable because the CIA, and maybe, again, maybe this is true of corporate America, but it was certainly a place that ran on networks. And so mm -hmm. if you were recruited out of Brown University, if you were all recruited out of Brown, that would be one potential network. If you were a Greek American, there was a Greek American network that was started by one uh, Greek American officer and then others would be brought in and they had their own sort of internal network. If you were with a certain geographic division, if you were with Africa division or Near East division, you might be part of that network. So, so the men at least could probably had a network that they could rely on and they had mentors and people who would protect them. And the early women, particularly the early women who wanted to be part of the clandestine service and work as spies on the street, which was the most sought after job. So they were really um, edged out uh, that it was very difficult for them because they just didn't have any kind of a network of loyalists who could protect them unless they created it themselves. Uh, in Eloise Page's case, she had started out as a secretary uh, during the war. She was secretary to Wild Bill Donovan, the director of the OSS. And a lot of these men had a lot of deep, dark personal secrets and, and their secretaries knew them all. And so <laughs> she just had the dirt on a lot of people. And that was one way that she was able to um, to prevail. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, it seems to me something like peer review in science where you submit your paper and your name is not on it and you don't know who's reviewing it. So it takes the bias out of it. If the CIA is publishing reports, but maybe they're not self-aware to know that they are biased against their own agents, but it seems like that would be a solution. Well, there are a lot of safeguards built into the system. So if you are a case officer and you're out on the street and you're working with an asset uh, in an African country and you just think he's got the greatest information uh, and, and you really like him and you're sure that he's given you great stuff. Uh, when you, after each meeting, you'll write uh, two reports, you'll write uh, information about the inf intelligence he provided and you'll also write about the source himself. Okay, this is how he's positioned. This is what's going on in his personal life. This is why I believe he's telling me the truth. And then you, you submit this to a reports officer who's like an editor and sort of a truth squatter who will say, well, you know, I know your asset is saying that, but I've heard that he's drinking a lot, or I've heard that his marriage isn't good, or I've heard that actually, you know what, he lost his job and he's getting all of this information out of the newspaper. And the reason I know this is because I read French and I'm reading the newspapers. And so uh, uh, bad news for you, the source that you've fallen in love with, it's called falling in love with your source, uh, is actually not credible, um, or maybe it is sort of partly credible. So the reports officer, and this used to be a very female position, working indoors in a CIA station at the desk and truth squatting the stuff that the guys on the street have collected. Um, and so, you know, there's this sort of in-between uh, where you're, you're getting the intelligence from this last meeting. You're saying, oh, yeah, that's interesting. And meanwhile, I've, I've read these other reports, and so that's how this fits in. And then uh, the reports officer would edit that cable and send it back to Washington, where the analysts then are going to read it, and they're going to start arguing about it. And uh, and and that is supposed to also remove bias, in the sense that all of these uh, all of these trained intellects will uh, will train themselves on this new intelligence and try to put it in context and 
how does this compare to four years ago? And uh, and if again, when you're doing the difficulty when you're doing counter ter- counterterrorism, when when the agency started really tracking and paying attention to different terrorist groups, and particularly Al Qaeda, this these are disconnected individuals who were traveling from Indonesia to Chechnya, or former Soviet Republic. And so they were moving from one geographic division to another. And, and, and the CIA for a long time was divided between geographic divisions. So if you wanted to write about this phenomenon, this guy's meeting with this guy in a different part of the world, you had to go to the Indonesia desk, as I said, and get them to agree that this guy's potentially a problem. And then you have to go to the Chechnya desk or whatever, Azerbaijan or whatever, and, and get them to agree. So that I think is it is ultimately an anonymous product. It's an unsigned product, which essentially tells the the president everybody at the CIA agrees that this is what's happening or this is what's going to happen. And you can imagine in any academic committee, like getting uh, getting consensus, getting consensus is what you have to do. And you can imagine how harrowing that is. As what I read in an academic paper about this it said you know at the end of the day you just would want to poke your eye out (laughs) yeah right all right let's talk about the misogynistic biases against women were they were they very broad in general women don't do this or women do do that or was it specific about their emotional intelligence or their cognitive abilities you know they're different from men in this way or that way that's a great question and then you know and then you have to ask yourself these biases that definitely existed, did did the men or some of the men uh, really believe this or was it out of self-interest? Because oh, right. the best job at the CIA or the most prestigious was being a case officer, was being the proverbial spy on the street, collecting secrets, uh, lurking in, you know, uh, back rooms or whatever, and 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 getting this priceless piece of, of intelligence that's going to make it to the president's desk. And 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 being out there like tossing uh, tossing shots back with suspected KGB officers, the cat and mouse games that were taking place in Moscow during the Cold War, the excitement and the importance and the stress of those kinds of jobs, that was really the 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 male dominated and, and not just male dominated, but a really uh, you know what we today might call toxic masculinity or just the very macho kind of culture. I can toss it back with you, Ivan. I mean, literally one case officer, that would be that would be the sort of uh, uh, encounter that you would have or imagine having. And so and so the view for decades was that women just can't do this work. It was the same thing that would be on Wall Street. Women just can't close a deal. Women just don't have the balls or they don't have the ambition or they don't have the ability to sit with it, sit with somebody at a table after a year of buttering them up and say, okay. I want you to become an asset. I want you to break your country's laws. I want you to spy. I want you to be a traitor to your own government and put your own life in danger by passing secrets to me. So for many, many years, for decades, the the institutional bias was that women cannot do that work, that there's work that women are good at. And that's being very careful and keeping records and working in the archives and providing us with the information that we need. So when we're going to recruit an asset in Poland, we can we can wire back to headquarters and these women that we call sneaker ladies or vault ladies will pour through their files and they'll write us up a report on this uh, Polish officer and they'll tell us who his dad was and who his family is. And women are good at making connections and they're good at being careful. And and so uh, there were biases about what women were good at. And then there were biases about the sorts of things women out on the street, they, they, they can't just close that deal, uh, ask that guy to spy, and, and they, um, they can't keep themselves safe in a foreign country, uh, and they won't be taken seriously in male-dominated cultures like Greece at the time. They, they won't be able to, they won't have the credibility that they need to get this kind of information. And so I think it is I mean, having looked at, at declassified doc- documents in which these views were openly expressed without any reservation or embarrassment, uh, I, I do believe that that was accepted, that that was true. But it was also a very convenient way to keep women out of the part of the clandestine service that led to advancement, that led to becoming a division chief, uh, that led potentially to becoming CIA director or the most prestigious positions at the agency. 
um, were you were you would be funneled up into those positions. So uh, that was that was what some of the you know some of the most fascinating interviews I had were with women who it was like jujitsu. You know, they just completely turned the tables on that kind of thinking. So one of my favorite characters, a woman named Heidi August, was sent uh, to Geneva to work at U UN headquarters there as a case officer. It was her very first posting. She had been hired as a clerk, and she had to be a clerk for a decade. And then she was made a case officer. It was a very arduous uh, test for her. And she went to Geneva where, um, you know, the American service, spy service and the Soviet or other communist countries, they were just always trying to penetrate each other and recruit each other, recruit each other in the coffee lounge, recruit each other in bars in Geneva, whatever. And it was, you know, men trying to recruit men because those are the high level officials in the 1980s. You know, they're all male in the 1980s in all countries. So they're all busy. And so Heidi, who had worked as a clerk was sitting in the UN meetings and she looked around and she saw these secretaries and administrative assistants and she knew the kind of access she had had to information at the station she had worked in. And she thought, hmm, you know, like there are a lot of women in these meetings and they probably have access to all the files in their offices. And it may be that as feminist sentiments are rising around the world that they're kind of pissed off about how they're being treated in their offices. And sure enough, she started meeting with a number of different women, cultivating them as potential assets. She learned how to play squash because this, this key asset that she really honed in on um, was a great squash player. And so she joined a squash club. She positioned herself on the bench so that she was there when the potential asset was there. She said, you know, I'm just learning how to play squash. I don't really understand how a backhand in squash differs from a backhand in tennis and the asset I said, well, I'll show you. And they became friends. And she took a year and she finally recruited this woman to steal a piece of technology from her office that provided the American spy service with um, access to a communication system that they had been trying to get access to for years. And when uh, the polygrapher, the, the um, person conducting the polygraph for the asset was called in, uh, before the operation was um, went forward, he said to Heidi, he said, God, you know, I've never been called, I've never been asked to polygraph a female asset before. And she, she said, welcome to the world. Uh, we were talking about uh, different examples of that kind of cognitive biases against women, these actual misogynistic biases. But I got to thinking, even if there are male, female differences in cognitive abilities or styles or emotional, uh, whatever, you know, it's going to be overlapping bell curves. So, you know, on average, men are taller than women, but there's plenty of women that are taller than men. So what right. are we talking about here? Why would they not want to cultivate some more sophisticated uh, recruitment tests or whatever, screening tests, and, and hire the right women that are higher than men on average on whatever it is they're looking for? You tell me. I, I mean, <laughs> okay, I, right. I, I, right. We've been, we've been asking that question for my entire adult life. Uh, what yeah. we want to uh, but I and I think, you know, also looking back at World War Two, World War Two was a, a moment of for the allies. It was a moment of being inclusive. It was a moment of admitting women of, you know, drawing on the full talents of your citizenry so that women could come in. And Grace Hopper uh, famously worked on the Navy's Mark One computer, uh, Vassar math professor, all this female talent, as well as the Tuskegee Airmen who were flying airplanes, as well as the Navajo code talkers. Right. So yeah. the allies are bringing in, are really taking advantage of the citizenship. And you look at the Germans and the Japanese, and by definition, the Germans were ex attempting to exterminate a segment of their own population. The Japanese were not bringing women into the war effort. And so the willingness to be inclusive, you, you'd think it was proven during World War II. But then, of course, in the post-war Cold War period, uh, it, the attempt is made to put this genie back in the bottle. And so when you ask, well, why wouldn't you want to draw on uh, on your full reservoir of talent and genius? Uh, I, I have, I've been trying to figure that out. Uh, but I think, you know, it boils down to self-interest in part, right? You want to keep the pie to yourself. Uh, not you personally, but, um, but the, the competition for 
uh, for talent, along with, you know, genuine prejudice, genuine prejudice and bias and the belief that that a certain group of people is more competent or or better, uh, uh, better equipped to take on the challenges of the post-World War II period. So a combination of motivations, I think. Yeah, I think they mostly probably really believed certain stereotypes about men and women. Yeah. I was just thinking of uh, Naomi Oreskes' book, Why, Why Trust Science?, I had her on the show. So she got a chapter there on, this is like late 19th, early 20th century, published science about why women cannot do math and STEM fields. And this was like a Harvard scientist published in a peer reviewed journal that had this whole theory about there's not enough blood in the brain to, you know, fuel that kind of higher abstract reasoning, you know, because the blood's all used in that reproductive system. Right. You know, and yeah. he had, they had data and these were you know, published, yeah. peer reviewed, you know, it's just astonishing that today you well, read these things and it's like something written by the Babylon Bee or the Onion. Like, exactly. Really? <laughs> that argument was made, was, was made to keep women out of higher education. I mean, there was a Harvard physician in the 1890s who argued that women shouldn't go to university because yeah, it's, that's the guy. Brain. It's while their brains at the expense of their wounds. Yes, that's the guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. some name apparently. Yeah, so I wonder if some of that was just carried over into the 1950s and 60s, and hopefully now we're past that. Yeah, well, hopefully. Here's what you wrote about Lisa Manful Harper. Lisa developed a feminine approach to espionage, using empathy and emotional intelligence to win trust and elicit secrets. That's what made me think of that. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you know, you, you also you get back to the problematic question of, you know, how, how different are the sexes and in what way are they different? And so one of the one of the kind of undersung uh, uh, qualities that you need to be a successful case officer, uh, espionage officer, is the ability to take care of people. So you recruit these people in very dangerous situation. They're they're providing a vital intelligence to the United States, sometimes for money, but sometimes because they believe that it's the right thing to do. And you have to take care of these people. You have to make sure that they're safe, that they're well-trained to keep themselves safe, but you also have to keep them safe yourself. You have to pay attention to their emotional and psychological well-being. How's their family life? Are they okay? This was very true during World War II, but it remained true that, and, and caregiving, you could argue about whether women are better caregivers or not, but it's certainly the case that women have a lot of training at caregiving. And so uh, during World War II, there was an incredibly successful female uh, agent who ran networks, Virginia Hall, and she took care of assets in occupied France and occupied Europe. She exfiltrated downed allied airmen. She really was able to take care of people in very dangerous situations. And so Lisa felt herself, Lisa Manful Harper, she felt as though she was able to use emotional intelligence to, to know whether an asset was okay uh, or to, or, and to trust her instincts if something seemed off, if it seemed like something wasn't right in his or her home life or if there was something that she needed to, uh, to take care of. Uh, and she also felt as though, in pre it, it, maybe especially in male-dominated cultures, she was less threatening to, to men as an asset. They wouldn't, they, they just would talk to her without, they, well, what's she going to do with this information? She couldn't be important. Uh, and so, and of course, sometimes in, in some situations, men might, and this was certainly true of Germans in World War II, talk to a young woman to try to impress her. Oh, look, here are our mm. plans to, you know, <laughs> develop a B-2 rocket. Uh, and the, and that, that was an actual uh, situation during World War II. And this young French woman would say, oh, I you put you put the <laughs> weapons system, and uh, and so Lisa would do that same sort of, um, uh, you know, could play a, a variety of roles uh, that would make men men in particular uh, comfortable in giving her information. <laughs> That's really funny. This picture of these guys sitting there going, "Oh, maybe if I give her a little bit of secrets, I'll get lucky tonight." Right. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here, let me draw you the plans of the rock. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Okay, right. All right, let's talk about the different roles uh, that the CIA played in the 1950s and 60s versus, say, 90s and 2000s. The shift from the Cold War, KGB, Soviet Union is the evil empire, and then all of a sudden it's terrorism that's the problem. And 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, where to start on that? Uh, your big question. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, so that this this generation of, of female case officers, the women I who were in the sort of first half of my book, uh, did make their careers in this Cold War climate where they had to overcome all of these biases and were able to prove, uh, you know, in Heidi's case by rec actually recruiting women with access to secrets. And in Lisa's case, by understanding how as a woman she could get men to talk to her, uh, maybe in a different way, they they really proved themselves during this Cold War uh, a period when, as you know as well as I do, uh, the, the the fear of nuclear mutual destruction was uh, was ever present and um, and deadly serious. And 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 then in the uh, 1990s. The Sov so the Soviet Union collapses in 1991. It does come as something of a surprise. And there are um, uh, many officers, older uh, m veteran officers who built their careers on the Cold War uh, contest who are, are now in the CIA as an institution. It's like, okay, are we going to, how are we going to turn this ship? This, you know, how are we going to turn this battleship or this uh, ocean liner, are we going to get rid of our Soviet analysis desks? Or, or are the Soviets, you know, have they not really collapsed the, as much as we think they are? Is this glasnost? Is that, is, that, is that a real thing? So people with entrenched careers in Soviet analysis are saying, no, you know, you need to keep, you need to keep, we need, we need the appropriate appropriations and, and the allocations. It, it's still important. And, and so there was a period of flailing and, and also a period when Congress says, you know what? Maybe we just maybe you just don't need as much money as you as you've been getting. You know, maybe we could use these resources for peace and prosperity and just enjoy this peace dividend for a while. And so and so things become very competitive with the CIA because they're losing money. And uh, and so meanwhile, as I said, there's this generation of young women who I identify with because I was coming into the workforce at about the same time who came in in the late 1980s, early 1990s, had been to co-educational universities, had not encountered the kind of rank discrimination that people like Lisa Harper and Heidi August had, who sort of come into this workplace like, hey, I'm coming out of a co-educational college. I did well as a student. This is going to be great. I'm, I'm patriotic and I am so happy to be here. And the playing field is level now because they let me into this college that wouldn't have admitted me before. And they don't realize how complicated the workforce is. And so a lot of these women, as I said, they do get kind of subtly routed into areas like imagery analysis or counterterrorism, which is just getting started because it hasn't yet emerged as a prestigious field but they're like, hey, I'm really smart. And this is really interesting. Like anything is interesting. Give me those images. Give me this. Wow, I'm in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and so they're smart and they're, they're really good at what they're doing. And as the 90s progress and, and there really is this terrorist threat that is um, changing form and materializing in the absence of the presence of the Soviet Union, foreign fighters are leaving Afghanistan Osama bin Laden is starting to fund uh, this entity that nobody quite understands because terrorism, which was a big problem in the mid 1980s when there were a lot of airplane hijackings that you might remember and that I remember, uh, that was that was um, entities that were often backed by countries or backed by states. Um, the most feared terrorist uh, organization in the 1990s was really Hezbollah. That people considered that to be the most dangerous entity. But meanwhile, there's just this network forming, this shadowy network forming. And that's when this group of analysts, not only women, but, uh, but it's sort of a striking number of them, female, who've been channeled into this niche field, really start trying to make their voices heard. Uh, and as they uh, wrestle with all sorts of other issues in their home life, like the desire to have children, which was um, something that was really not possible for uh, women serving in the 1960s and 70s often. Uh, and so, so there's this, there's this, you know, having to turn this ship that the, this big institution has become with a lot of entrenched desks. And, and then, then we get into the signal and the noise problem. This small, obscure group that is 
hearing the signal and, and trying to understand it and trying to get the resources that they need to really understand it uh, is, is, is trying to make it, itself heard. And, and, uh, and that does eventually happen within the CIA uh, so that in the, a year before 9-11 occurs, Director George Tenet really does understand that that peril is imminent. Um, but then the, the task becomes making the national security establishment uh, and the Bush administration, which is populated with a lot of really heavyweight neoconservatives who are not convinced that this is a problem. You know, even when you win the argument in your own institution, you then have to make the argument in Washington as a whole. And uh, that was, uh, that was, it, it, again, it was a chaotic time. It was the 2000 election. You know, it was the contest between Al Gore and George uh, Bush. And it was the uncertainty of that period. And um, the Clinton administration dropped some balls. Uh, also, but had, you know, understood some aspects of this. And then that gets lost in this messy transition between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. So there's just, uh, um, again, this, this um, overused now perfect storm analogy uh, that, uh, that all coalesced uh, in uh, 2001. Yeah. You mentioned uh, no one saw it coming, the fall of the Soviet Union. Is that a failure of intelligence, or is it that the Soviets themselves didn't know it was going to happen? History is often chaotic. They don't right. even know what they're going to do. Right. right. And so how right. would an intelligence agency know what yeah. they're going to do? Yeah, and I'm not an expert in, uh, in Soviet analysis, and I'm sure that there are many, many, many papers and books that have been written on on that. Uh, but as I said, I, I was told you know, that even in the CIA, they didn't know whether they could really trust uh, Glasnost and Perestroika, and is this really happening or is it a ruse? And um, and of course, it was it was a period in time that uh, that is is over uh, now, and and we've returned to something much closer to World War II and the Cold War combined. Uh, so it was, you know, it's this problem of can we trust what we think we're seeing, even, even if, you know. Not just can we can we project what's going to happen, but now that it seems to be happening, is it is it really happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about the that principle of conspiracism never attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence or chance and randomness. So much of, now, I wouldn't apply that to Putin and Ukraine. <laughs> That's malice. Right. But right. But but often I think the, instead of blaming the intelligence agencies, why didn't they see this coming? You know, maybe Osama bin Laden himself didn't decide. 9-11 we pulled the trigger on that until a few months before maybe you know maybe there was just a lot of randomness going on beneath the top-down attempts to orchestrate some kind of attack and so it's really hard to see if they don't even really know what exactly they're going to do until yeah, the last minute there were certainly analysts who felt that the clinton administration could have taken more decisive action that they were certain there was an mm. escalation of attacks and when the USS Cole uh, oh, was yeah. attacked, that, um, and there was no s serious retaliation for that, the analysts were very surprised by that. They thought that was an act of war. But just as you say, Michael, it's it's such a difficult situation because there were there were um, some incidences in 2001 where the analysts saw that there was an attack, there was a conspiracy forming, and that there was an attack being planned. And, and they were warning, and they were warning foreign liaison as well. I mean, this was very important. The CIA was working with all these other liaison partners that also didn't want explosions and hijackings and attacking, attacks taking place in their midst. So we're working with all these foreign agencies. What, if, you know, what are you seeing? Here's what we're seeing. What are you seeing? And the CIA analysts predicted that an attack was going to happen. I think it was right after the millennium uh, going into 2001. And so the warning all these foreign partners, you know, you got to thwart this, you got to stop this. And nothing ever happened. And so, so the analyst said to me, you know, we were being laughed at because it didn't happen. We were being laughed at by our foreign partners. They're like, oh, you said that was going to happen and it didn't. And, uh, and it turned out that the terrorists had tried to do it, 
but they sunk their own boat. They didn't place the charge correctly in the boat. And so it was an attempted attack. It was it was thwarted by their incompetence, just as you say. And so it didn't go forward. It was supposed to go forward. The analyst was right. The analysts were right, but this didn't, this this wasn't found out until years later. So they were discredited in the eyes of their own agency and in the eyes of foreign partners for crying wolf. And 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 so just as you say, I mean, like, what can you do? In <laughs> right. that? How can you how can you guard against that? You can't. They were right. Events intervened. They were made to look as though they had cried wolf. And then, you know, then it gets harder to get buy in the next time. Yeah. I have a list in my conspiracy book of of uh, why we should believe uh, Al Qaeda when they said that, that they did 9-11 because of all the other things that happened. The 1983 attack on the Marine barracks in Lebanon by radical Hezbollah faction, 1993 truck bomb, World Trade Center building, 95, 1995 attempt to blow up 12 planes heading from Philippines to the United States, 1995 bombings of U.S. Embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, 96 attack, Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, 99 failed attempt to attack LAX, uh, 2000 suicidal boat attack on the USS Cole, it just goes on and on. It's like, oh, they actually do a lot of things like that. So we yeah. should be leery. Yeah. And you talk about cognitive bias, you know, for a, a number of those attacks that you cite. Well, for one thing, a credit hadn't hadn't been identified or named in, uh, you know, right. in some of those time periods. But even in 98, the embassy, those twin embassy bombings in, in Africa, uh, in, in Nairobi and in Tanzania, the initial assumption of the cave officers who went over there, oh, this had to be Hezbollah. That this is that's the only entity that is capable of, of mounting simultaneous uh, mm. attacks. And because that, so that's a kind of a cognitive bias. Like that's just an assumption that you make. And when in fact, this group of analysts was saying, no, Al Qaeda is capable of this. And one of the case officers who ultimately wrote a book about this said, he, he had a, one of these analysts traveling with him and she said, just consider that it might be Al Qaeda and ask for, there were certain names he was asking the African officials for. She said, ask him for these names also, because at least be open to the possibility that it's not Hezbollah, that it's Al Qaeda. And to his credit, he did. He listened and he looked at those names and he said in his book, he said, wow. And that's when, and it wasn't, it wasn't too long before um, uh, terrorists were apprehended who confirmed uh, that it was Al Qaeda. Um, but that was, that was an officer who was open to, a, to, even though he made an initial assumption, was open to an alternative explanation. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it's like that 9-11 terrorist who took flight lessons on flying, but not landing or taking off. <laughs> In yeah. hindsight, it's like, well, how did they miss that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's when also you get into this, um, back to our initial topic of infighting between the CIA and the FBI. Uh, hmm. Because the FBI, the law enforcement agency, the cops, they were picking up on on some aspects like the learning to fly planes and not land them. And they were not sharing that information with the CIA and vice versa. So the the two different agencies were sort of working on parallel courses, but they were very much at odds. And the legal definition of what could be shared was still very much an open question. Uh, and, and so it was just uh, a, just a disastrous chaos of miscommunication. Uh, malice and incompetence, I would say, you know, or chance. Yeah, but uh, there's some hindsight bias there again. You know, all the airline hijackings in the past, dozens and dozens of them, uh, uh, they all land wanted to land, and they had demands, uh, the, you right. know, political demands or whatever, let our prisoners go and and so forth. Right. So it's right. really not fair to say you should have seen it coming. That was new. That was, mm -hmm. I mean, to give Osama bin Laden credit, I that mean, was a pretty just, creative, said, clever attack that, that we hadn't really thought um, of. Detected and sometimes spoiled in the 1990s. There was a there there was talk about flying a plane into CIA headquarters. So there had been some talk of you know, actually flying a plane into a building, uh, but nothing on the level of 9-11. I did want to ask you about, oh, by the way, I, I had my senior moment come back. It was Clarice Starling from the FBI. That was it. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Everybody's seen this film. Um, how accurate is that, Zero Dark Thirty? Well, it's accurate uh, in the sense that um, 
well, there, there, there is, there is a, a female officer who that central character is based on, uh, the Maya character. There is one person that, that, uh, was the model for Maya. And, but there were also many, many other targeters who were working that, um, and, and, and different officials who were obviously working the effort as well. Um, so, uh, but I, I think, you know, aspects of it are, are pretty accurate and there are characters in even, even, um, small characters who are based on real clandestine officers who aren't, they aren't identified in the movie, but uh, watching the movie, I, I knew who those characters were based on. Give, give us a sense of when you talk about opening a station in some foreign country, what does that mean? I mean, they just CIA just walks in and rents a building and there's, you know, nondescript on the door or whatever. How, how do they even set up something like that? Well, I think it depends on whether the station is declared or or not declared. And and you're talking about a character in the book Heidi August who yeah. after she um after she uh got that piece of technology in Geneva, that real achievement, she was promoted uh to uh to open a station in the Mediterranean, which was just extraordinary, uh after a first posting uh to do that. And in her case, uh, they were undeclared to the host government. So they weren't even working with the host government because the host government had been penetrated uh, by Libya and, and other entities. And they knew that if, if they were declared to the host government, they would essentially be declared to Libya. And so, uh, you know, she didn't provide every detail about how you open a station, but essentially it was her and a secretary and they, she was there under diplomatic cover, which is very common, you know, working as a visa processor. So everybody just thinks she's a nondescript visa lady. She's a, she's a lady who stamps her visas and decides whether you get to come to America. And in fact, that by doing that, she knew, uh, you know, everybody who was asking for admittance to the United States. She knew the comings and goings of anybody who wanted to enter the United States or get permission to do so. So she had a lot of information. And... Um, one thing that CIA officers do is, is they, you know, they work with liaison uh, officials, regardless of whether or not they're declared, and and they'll actually try to recruit. Uh, there was a there was an investigator uh, in, well, she was spending a lot of time in Malta, and there was an investigator in Malta who was working with the FBI. To, to learn how to handle a hijacking. And, uh, and she also met with him to recruit him to give her information that he wasn't giving the FBI, uh, which he agreed to do because he thought that Malta was not doing enough to uh, deal with hijacking and terrorism. And he, so he believed uh, that, that more needed to be done. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes I would, that was, this is described to me by a number of officers. You'll have a formal a relationship with a liaison intelligence officers uh, in another country, but you also try to separately recruit some of those liaison officers to tell you even more than they're telling you in their official capacity. You're, you know, you're trying to get even more information so you have sidebar meetings with the same people and try to get them to give you information that they're not really authorized to give you. So these liaison relationships are very, very important. And um, they and, and also women were often assigned to liaison roles with other governments. And it was, again, not quite as prestigious as being a case officer on the street trying to recruit assets. But it, it's very important, our ability to work with foreign intelligence agencies um, in a liaison capacity. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what happened with the intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that Bush used as a pretext to invading? Well, I, you know, I haven't done deep in-depth reporting uh, the way some, you know, podcasts yeah. and investigative reporting, but it, it cognitive bias is uh, wishful thinking, cognitive bias. He, you know, he, ha he just about did it before. We're getting a lot of pressure. Uh, there's this germ, again, liaison. There's this, I think, German-run source curveball Who's uh, who's making these these claims? Uh, we have a good relationship with the Germans. I I, I think that again I I don't want to get like out of my depth here, but 
Um, but relying on liaison, believing that it probably was true because it had been true in the past, it was plausible, being pressured. Uh, and, uh, but but the, the idea of cognitive bias was, um, was, was used to describe this situation to me several times. And then there was a, there was a parallel effort. There was pressure by members of the Bush administration to get the CIA to acknowledge or to say, not acknowledge, but to, to say that there was a relationship between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda. Uh, and, and they, I interviewed many analysts, a number of analysts who really held the line on that one. And, and there is a lot of fake uh, documentation. There's propaganda. I mean, that was a problem with Kurt Ball. Well, you've got to recognize what is fabricated evidence, you know, of, um, of, of uh, that, that one of the hijackers had been meeting with, uh, with Saddam Hussein's people. Uh, and there were documents that were found that purported. Uh, and so there was great analytical work done by a team that was looking at some of these purported documents that proved a relationship. And they, they sent it to the, um, uh, they they sent it to the counterfeiting the uh, the uh, a, the Secret Service, which has their counterfeiting uh, uh, detection unit, and and it, they said no, this ink, uh, this paper is is newer than the date that is pur- that that is purported. You know, it was purported to have been written, and so they they debunked uh, information that was being dangled at them that would have proven a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda. So Right. There was that business of yellow cake that they maybe were using to develop nuclear weapons and so forth. Right. And so I'm not an expert on that, but 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 there's also a lot of um there's a lot of incentive for propaganda and false information when the United when it's known all over the world that the United States is looking for an excuse to invade Iraq is very open to information that would give them a uh, excuse to do so. And then you get what's called walk-ins. You get people all over the world who know that the United States has a lot of money and they're coming to U.S. embassies and they're saying, I've, I've, got, I've got some hot intelligence for you if you'll just give me a million dollars or whatever. And so, you know, when word gets out, um, it, 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 it's sort of, again, it's like the crisis. Of, it's like a migrant. When word gets out around the world, the United States, this has, you know, it's, has this policy uh, or is changing its policy on this, like people become aware of it. And that's what reports officers told me that um, we just knew that this was going to happen. Word was going to get out. There are going to be all these walk-ins. They were going to be, they were going to be dangling false information. They were going to be pursuing U.S. dollars and the standards were going to be lowered for vetting this information. And and so bad information gets through. Interesting. Yeah. So it's not just, it's just not just detecting the signal, you know, it's, they were encouraging. They were, you know, when when there's enough noise, yeah, a bad signal gets through. Yeah, it, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, very probably. All right, Liza, last question. Given that you're writing a book about a, a super secret organization, how do you trust your own sources? <laughs> how do you decide what's good information? Yeah, that's um. That believe me, I ask myself that question because, uh, you know, in, in a number of cases, people are telling me if they're if they're talking about operations that they ran. Uh, you can't necessarily get confirmation that this is true uh, or that it actually happened. And in, in some cases, I could. I could get paper documentation. Um, and I interviewed, I, I mean, I conducted hundreds of interviews. And so if I'm if I'm going to rely on Elisa Harper to talk about her career, and if other case officers who, who I trust, who are separately telling me unsolicited Lisa Harper was the real deal. I mean, she was just a terrific case officer. And uh, and yeah, those guys undermined her. If I'm hearing that from different people in conversations unsolicited, then, you know, then that is an indication to me that uh, that I, I can trust what she's saying. I mean, but but you do. I mean, people aren't they aren't going to tell you everything and they can't tell you everything. And in some cases they had to they had to figure out in their own minds what they could say and what they hadn't, couldn't. Uh, and it's, yeah, you, you, you continually ask yourself that question. I mean, that's true in any kind of reporting and research, um, but particularly true, uh, true now. But I was surprised at, at uh, for example, when Lisa was telling me about her 
being thwarted early in her career when the CIA began to train her. Uh, but when she pushed back against the kind of training that they were trying to provide her, they just cut short her training. They just sent her back to headquarters. And I happened to interview a woman who had been in her same class, Janine Bruckner. And she said, yep, I remember when that happened. And that was a textbook uh, kind of thing that they did. It happened to her. It happened to other women. And so uh, and, th and there have been documents declassified also of, of women who remembered um, who gave interviews, say, 20 or 30 years ago about some of the events in the uh, in the book. And, and they confirmed it as well. So whenever possible, I try to confirm it with some sort of declassified record or confirmation from another uh, another officer, at least one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so they'd occasionally say, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, Liza. I loved your book. I hope uh, they should, somebody should make a movie about this. It's It's a great story. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, as I said, it's a multi-generational saga. So um, maybe it'll have to be a series, but I, I would love, yeah, I would love to see that. It should be um, a Netflix series. Netflix yeah. is always looking for those well, multi-part uh, series said. to keep people yeah. uh, tuned yeah. in. So, <laughs> all right, what are you working on next? What's your next uh, line of research? I've got some, I've got some declassified documents that I applied uh, that I, before the pandemic, I filed a bunch of FOIA requests uh, <laughs> And and the, the the papers are finally trickling in. So I've got it actually in the corner of my office. It's not visible. I've got a bunch of brown Manila envelopes that I haven't opened yet. Uh, and I it's been so long ago that I filed the FOIAs. I've actually for, I, I I've forgotten what they are. So um, so that my next test at least is to open the envelopes and see okay. what the documents. That sounds right. good. Well, authors are usually always noodling away at what might yeah. next be a future project. So we'll have you back on when you do your next project. All right. Thanks, Liza. 